The year was 2010. I was a 17 year old high schooler hungry for new and preferably edgy gaming experiences to fill the void left by Stalker, which by that point I had already played and beaten a dozen times. One day, while I was browsing the still fledgling and eventually cursed platform that would become my hobby 12 years later, I stumbled across a let's play of a post-apocalyptic first-person shooter called Metro 2043. I can't for the life of me track the exact clip, but I recall the creator mentioning the game's pedigree and passing that it was developed by ex-Stalker devs under a new studio. Not half a day later, I was in possession of a Metro 2043 copy of Unmentionable Origins and fumbling around the dark and irradiated metros of Moscow. I was hooked from the start. The game's premise, that of a post-apocalyptic world where the remnants of humanity retreated to the metros to escape the irradiated and war-torn surface, seemed so cool and original. Metro's premise is so simplistic that as an amateur writer, I remember feeling a tinge of envy for not having thought about it myself. Moreover, as a young man who had just started dipping his toes into adult topics like politics and sociology and had lots, and I mean lots of opinions about basically everything, Metro's punk energy and political satire was just what the doctor ordered. And I think it comes as no surprise that as an Eastern European who came of age in a deeply dysfunctional post-communist society, I resonate with Metro's aesthetics and themes on an emotional level to this day. I'd argue that Metro's sense of loss and melancholy hit even harder now that I've gotten older and have experienced these things firsthand. As opposed to 17-year-old me whose most pressing matter was some variation of how can I get the most drunk with the least amount of beers and maybe have enough money left for half a pack of cigarettes. So in this video we're gonna explore Metro 2043's presentation, gameplay, setting and everything in between. In this video I'll talk about the 2014 Redux version, which introduced new graphical changes as well as some new gameplay mechanics from the sequel Metro Last Light. Don't worry we're gonna touch on the differences a bit later in the video. Before we start I have a Twitter where tweets get tweeted and a Patreon where you can support my work with real life money. Let's go! Dude, look at that leg space. What is this? Ryanair? <laughs> Metro 2043 takes place in, well, 2043, in Moscow, 20 years after a global nuclear holocaust. Moscow, and most of the world for that matter, has become an irradiated wasteland, uninhabitable to humans without protective gear. Radiation clouds have obscured the skies ever since, thrusting the world into a permanent state of nuclear winter. On top of that, killer mutants of all shapes and sizes roam the surface, effectively pushing humanity back at the bottom of the food chain. There's simply nothing left for humanity on the surface. These factors force the surviving population to seek shelter in the Moscow metro, hoping to ride the nuclear holocaust out for I don't know, 3-4 years stops maybe, until the radiation from the surface dissipates? This plan didn't pan out, leaving the survivors no choice but to resign themselves to the Metro Rat lifestyle for the foreseeable future. Only in this case, the Metro Rat lifestyle doesn't involve the good stuff like nibbling electric cables and dragging half-rotten pizza slices through crowds of disgusted commuters, but like dealing with the Metro's decaying infrastructure and like politics. For starters, certain pockets of the metro are also irradiated and filled with water or debris. The infrastructure is so dilapidated that even mundane tasks like activating gates and switches is a pain. Secondly, the scarcity of essential resources led to the formation of various factions of differing ideologies as to who and to whom they should be distributed. The most notable factions are the Red Line, a Stalinist regime, the Fourth Reich, no elaboration needed here. Hansa, a hyper-capitalist trading alliance comprising several stations. Think of a post-apocalyptic version of the Hanseatic League. And the Spartan Order, a group of elite soldiers helping stations fend off bandits and mutants. Some of these factions often butt heads over territory and politics, effectively perpetuating the cycle of dysfunction that turned the surface into a nuclear wasteland. The Red Line and the Fourth Reich, for example, are in a constant state of war with each other, fighting for control over non affiliated stations. As if that wasn't enough, some sections of the metro contain anomalies of possibly supernatural origin. 
intelligence that cause psychic damage towards those that come in contact with them. Oh, and the metro is also infested with mutants, so there's that. Normally, I dedicate more video real estate to exploring factions, but I think I'll put a pin in this until the Metro Last Light video. That's because the sequel fleshes out the factions more than 2043. Now, Metro 2043's plot is pretty straightforward. The game kicks off with the Northern Station of Exhibition attacked by the Dark Ones, mysterious creatures of uncertain origins that possess psychic powers. An elite ranger named Hunter asks a survivor, Artyom, the adopted son of the station commander and the playable character, to travel to Polis and lobby the station's authorities for support to fight the Dark Ones who, according to Hunter, pose the greatest existential threat to humanity since the nuclear war. By the way, I'm not gonna discuss Metro 2043 story here, I'll save it for the last light video for reasons I'll discuss there. Now, Metro 2043 is effectively a coming-of-age story chronicling Artyom's transformation from the sheltered and relatively privileged son of a station commander to an adult facing the dangers of the Metro like everyone else. It's a simple story, but it works as the first entry of a trilogy. And that's about everything you need to know about the story for now. Again, I'll discuss it more in depth in the last light video. I'll be them, Bourbon! There he is! Billy! Metro 2043 is still a good looking game despite closing in on its 10th anniversary. I'm talking about the 2043 Redux version which came out in 2014, not the original 2010 release. Yes, time passes like a motherfucker, I am so ready for the urn, dude. On the technical side, the game utilizes the 4A engine, a proprietary game engine created in-house. The engine, developed by two ex-GSC Game World programmers whose names I'll display on the screen to prevent embarrassing myself, began as a pet project due to one of the developers name on screen, frustrations with the X-Ray engine powering the Stalker games. The X-Ray engine was an utter mess. It was broken to the point that it seemed to possess a conscience of its own. One moment it would work as intended and the next it would go goblin mode and break the game entirely. It's basically the house cat of game engines, which is also why there's a one-to-one -one ratio between cat and Stalker glitches videos on the internet. Interestingly, a small scandal broke out in 2010 surrounding the origins of the 4A engine, with G sees founder claiming that the tech was derived from an improved pre-release version of the stalker code. A 4A game strongly refuted this and the controversy kinda fizzled out after that as there's been no official update since then, at least that I know of. Also, I don't know shit about shit in terms of engines or game development or really anything, I just thought it's an interesting footnote in gaming history that was worth mentioning. Plagiarism or not, there's a clear artistic lineage between Stalker and Metro 2033. As both games feature oppressive post apocalyptic worlds with post Soviet sensibilities. And that's about it as far as similarities are concerned. While 4A games welcomed comparisons to the likes of Fallout 3 and Stalker in interviews, their aim was to stand out from other post apocalyptic titles, which, as you may recall, were all the rage. <laughs> and in the early 2010s. To achieve this goal, 4E focused on story, setting and atmosphere. We've already touched on the setting, so let's discuss the visuals. Again, I need to reiterate that the footage you're seeing now is of the 2014 Redux version which added a bunch of graphical changes, such as improved lighting, animations, particle effects and dynamic weather. Also, while remakes slash remasters are the norm now, this practice was very unusual in the early 2010s. <sighs> Such innocent times. Anyways, Metro is still a visual treat to this day. Let's be honest, subway service tunnels don't make for the most visually appealing of spaces, so the visuals and art direction had a lot of heavy lifting to do. Thankfully, the environments are packed with small details, and the excellent lighting and shadow work lend a lot of personality and oomph to the game's spaces. There's a constant sense of dread following you everywhere you go. Sound plays a huge role in establishing the aforementioned sense of dread. Metro sound landscape is equally oppressive, whether you're stumbling around in the metro's dimly lit tunnels or trudging through Moscow's irradiated ruins. In the metros, you're met with this constant droney hum interspersed with ambiental noises like water dripping from pipes, old malfunctioning machinery, rats squeaking at your feet and even the occasional distant wail of anguish let out by some, you know, poor fucker while devoured by a mutant. However, metro sound design is at its absolute peak in the missions that take place in Moscow proper. Here, the game uses sound to drive home the point that no matter how dangerous 
dangerous the tunnels are, the surface is way, way worse. There's loads of small touches, like the wind constantly whistling in your ears, the odd bush rustling in your periphery, or mutants screaming somewhere in the distance most likely closer than the echoes might have you think. Artyom's labor breathing through his pre-war busted up gas mask is just the cherry on top of this dread and anxiety kick. It's, it's, it's great. I know what I'm about to say is going to age as soon as I jump into Metro Exodus, but for me, Nuclear Winter has never sounded this immersive. In my Follow New Vegas video way, way back in 2020, I pointed out that the destruction and dilapidation of its world was still extreme, given that the bombs had fallen 200 years before the events of the game. Metro 2043 addresses this pet peeve of mine in the sense that while the metros could definitely look better, they show signs of human activity and reconstruction efforts. Domestic spaces, for example, are kept relatively tidy and debris free. You'll rarely see people sleeping on moldy mattresses surrounded by random junk like in the newer Fallout games. The same thing applies to public spaces like markets and bars. Also, Metro addresses the most important question good world building has to answer. What do they eat? And the answer is pigs and mushrooms. <laughs> in fact, Metro's hubs in general are very well realized and have a strong, uh, you know, you know that, ex that expression I always use, a strong uh, sense of place. <laughs> I'm so sorry, it's 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 such a good expression. Anyways, I'm a sucker for hub areas and there's lots of cool stuff to see and experience in Metro's neutral locations. You know, small things like NPCs acknowledging your existence when bumping into them, or uh, Metro zones, Metronies, having their own routines and conversations. People eat, sleep, gossip, share horror stories over a drink at the bar, you get the idea. The hub locations feel very lively, they feel, dare I say, comfy, but it's a different breed of comfy. I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain. Let me put it this way, Metro is the closest any game has gotten to the sense of comfiness sitting by the bonfire and stalker conveyed. Those who played stalker know what I'm talking about, and in my opinion it's thanks to these hub locations that the game as a whole emanates a very real sense of warmth and humanity, of dogged resistance in the face of adversity. Metro's world is bleak, desolate and dangerous, one look at the surface is enough to confirm that, so these moments of rest Despite are essential to relieve pressure and allow players to take in the world. While I do wish these hub locations were a bit bigger, in retrospect I think their small size is precisely why they work so well. Knowing me, if the hubs were larger I would definitely have missed lots of cool flavor dialogue. That being said, there are a few small quirks that I have to point out. While Metro is a good looking game, some elements are showing their age. Animations and especially facial animations look stiff and wooden. NPC face mod are somewhere between the uncanny valley and the intense smiling death stare former high school classmates throw at you when they're trying to recruit you into their latest multi-level marketing scheme. The chances of them forcing you to sign your inheritance away at gunpoint to fund their business venture are small, but not zero. I, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> My next issue is accessibility related. So, my intention was to play the game with Ukrainian slash Russian audio and English subtitles for full immersion, but that meant missing out on NPC conversations as only a select few are subtitled. I can't really explain why, I suspect it's because background chatter often overlaps, so 4A Games decided to provide subtitles only for conversations that they deemed super important in terms of world building. That also means that I can't really showcase unsubtitled conversations without padding the video with with b-rolls, so you'll just have to trust me when I say that they're very, very good. I don't know, it's a bit annoying, not gonna lie, but it's not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. So let's jump into the gameplay. <laughs> So the 2014 Redux release not only shaved off the original's many rough edges, it also revamped the gameplay to such a degree that the Metro I played in 2023 is almost an entirely different game from the one I experienced in 2010. First, let's talk about Metro's difficulties. From the outset, the game has you choose one of two so-called playstyles, Survival and Spartan. Survival offers a slower survival horror oriented experience, in that resources such as gas mask filters and ammo and medkits are in short supply. The Spartan playstyle is faster paced and more action oriented. Also, in stark contrast to its name, resources are 
plentiful. I had to double check my footage to verify this because the naming convention is a bit confusing. Now here's where it gets interesting. Choosing a playstyle reveals four additional difficulty settings that affect things like resource distribution, enemy and player damage output and the amount of information the game offers you. For example, in Ranger Normal, the HUD and UI are limited and resources are scarce. Ranger Hardcore takes it a step further by disabling the HUD and UI and increasing the difficulty all across the board. It's an interesting way to do game difficulty and I like the granularity of this system. I went with Survival Normal because it seemed like the best choice for my skill level. My reflexes are not what they used to be and I was never good at first person shooters to begin with. Now unlike Stalker, which is in many ways its spiritual predecessor, Metro is a linear narrative driven game with brief moments of semi open ended exploration. Metro is a textbook case of playing to your strengths. If you want to create the kind of immersive experience with the deliberate methodical gameplay that Metro offers, linear design is pretty much the only way to go. Well, that is, until Metro Exodus, but that's a story for another video. <laughs> immersive is one of those words that get thrown around a lot in these YouTube video essays, so let me explain what I mean. From the outset, the studio's aim with Metro was for every scene to contribute to the game's narrative. Since turning every plot beat into a cutscene was impractical, not to mention insane, 4 Games instead opted to craft immersion through the aforementioned neutral hub areas and environmental storytelling. On that same note, 4A decided to keep the HUD minimalistic, or outright remove it on the highest difficulty levels. Admittedly, in 2023, keeping the HUD minimalistic and having environmental storytelling do the narrative heavy lifting is quite standard game design, unless you're Ubisoft. However, in Metro's case, this was just the foundation on top of which 4A games built several immersion contributing micro-mechanics, and that the game puts many of its cues in the environment. To view objectives, the player has to physically open Artyom's journal. What's cool about this micro mechanic is that it's a little more involved than it might sound. So you hold M to whip out Artyom's notebook and lighter. Pressing right click has Artyom bring the notebook closer to his face, thus revealing the objectives. If it's too dark to make out the objectives, you can press the left click button to make Artyom flick his lighter and move it closer to the journal. Artyom's journal also contains a compass that points players to the main objective and quite endearingly, a used and spare pencil. Artyom's notebook is proof that one should always strive to stock up on stationary items and present information and bullet points. Post-apocalypse be damned. Anyways, you'd be forgiven for viewing this journal system as nothing more than a mechanical artifice, but it's actually more than that. Aside from the immersive aspect, the journal adds a layer of friction because you can't shoot when using it. You may be unlucky enough to whip the journal out exactly when a mutant is about to pounce at you. Obviously, this applies mostly to first-time players as Metro veterans may counteract this through map knowledge and memorizing enemy spawn times and locations. In terms of gadgets, Artyom also flashes a Metro-made watch on his left wrist. Artyom's watch is one of the most useful items in the series. For one, it shows the amount of time until the gas mask's filter runs out and needs to be replaced. It also displays Artyom's level of cover and visibility based on the amount of light he's in. Like the journal, the watch can be brought up to the center of the screen for better visibility. By the way, the time shown on Artyom's watch is actually the time that is programmed into the system. As you can see, I recorded this clip at 3.30pm. It's when I realized that I lacked clips showcasing the watch, so I literally stopped writing and got back into the game to record some snippets, which should give you some idea of my organizational skills. An interesting mechanic, at least in my opinion, some people disagree, is that the movement speed decreases when the character is walking on certain surfaces or through liquids and cobwebs. And let me tell you, few things are more anxiety inducing than walking into a cobweb spun by some disgusting mutated spider who has crossbred with I, I don't even want to know what. Thankfully, Artyom can flick his trusty lighter and burn the cobwebs. To get a rough idea of the amount of bullets left in the magazine, you can simply take a peek at it. By pressing G, Artyom wipes the grime off his gas mask. As the player sustains 
damage, the gas mask screen becomes cracked, decreasing visibility. Artyom is equipped with a universal charger that he uses to charge up his flashlight and night vision goggles. Similar to the journal, the universal charger requires two hands to operate, leaving you vulnerable and open to enemy attacks. As you can see, Metro 2033 has lots of cool touches that contribute to immersion. Interestingly, these micro mechanics are also the reason why Metro 2033 is a hard game to describe. Metro's deliberate and methodical pace separates the game from your typical first person shooter. It's not exactly a survival horror either, or even a traditional horror game. It has stealth mechanics, but those weren't even featured in the original release. They were added in the Redux version. Metro is a hybrid. It dips its toes in shooting, stealth and survival horror, but it excels in none. So let's start with the weapon design. Of particular note in terms of design are the post-war weapons created by Metro dwellers following the nuclear holocaust. The most iconic post-war weapons are the Uboinik and the Bastard. The Uboinik is a six-chamber automatic shotgun similar in design to a revolver. I won't get into the details of its construction, so I'll just say that it's a formidable weapon effective against any opponent once up close. The Uboinik feels great to shoot, and the fact that it's lovingly animated mechanisms are on full display adds a whole lot to the experience. The Bastard is a carbine slash machine pistol. It was one of the first weapons created following the war and it's also the cheapest to produce. It has a high rate of fire but poor accuracy, high recoil and issues with jamming and overheating. The weapon's propensity to jam and overheat is why it's called the Bastard by the way. But just look at its design, it looks so fucking cool. My biggest gripe is that the pre-war weapons perform generally better than their post-apocalyptic counterparts. I mean, it makes sense that military-grade weapons are of higher quality than the pieces of shit improvised by Ivan from scrap under the dim light of a lantern, but still. Another feature added from Metro Last Light is customizable weapons. Don't expect anything revolutionary in terms of weapon attachments, you got your scopes, barrels, suppressors, grips and stocks and so on, all of which come with advantages and disadvantages. Attachments are purchasable at hub merchants between missions, though you can find some weapons already outfitted with upgrades in the wild. Metro has an interesting economy in that the pre-war military grade rounds that serve as currency and the Metro can be used Used as regular ammunition. They provide the user with increased stopping power but they're scarcer and there's also the fact that you're literally shooting money, which may be needed later to buy medkits and equipment. I'd advise against using them as regular ammunition until the late game. Now in terms of shooting, the gunplay is good in that weapons act and feel how weapons are supposed to. Combat against humans is mostly fine. Opponents hide behind cover, try to flank you and close in on your position, there's really nothing more to add here. Combat against mutants is where I'd say the game takes a turn for the jank. Fighting mutants is tense and occasionally horrifying, but not always for the right reasons. The Watchers, for instance, which are these mammal-like mutants known for their distinctive growl, move so fast that I had really big trouble keeping up with them. Look, I know Metro 2033 is not a power fantasy and that mutants are supposed to be challenging. The issue is that Watchers blended in with the environment so well that by the time I made them out, they'd already started attacking me. This drawback could have been mitigated by melee, but unfortunately that's not the case in Metro. Knife attacks feel off, like I'm hitting the air, they just don't seem to connect. I don't know whether it's an animation slash feedback or a me problem, but yeah. Now Watchers aren't the only enemy type you'll face in Metro. A later level introduces Librarians, huge quasi-intelligent gorilla-like creatures that haunt the Moscow State Library. Librarians are more passive than the common mutant varieties, so there's no need to kill them. Well, it's not like you have a choice anyway, since Librarians can sustain a ton of damage. I failed to kill one even with my difficulty settings. Anyways, the team used this opportunity to build an interesting one-off mechanic around their passive Basically, Artyom can prove he's not a threat by standing his ground and staring the librarian down until it walks away. If Artyom turns his back on it, the librarian attacks, and if Artyom fights back, the librarian will not relent unless killed. Emphasis on standing your ground, because as you can see in the footage, I didn't get the memo. I'd misheard Miller's advice and I thought that I had to stare it down while backing away from it. This led to some comical situations where I'd feel my way towards the exit, 
with my back facing the door and the compass brought to the center of the screen. I'm so fucking stupid sometimes. It's a great mission, very intense, very atmospheric, such a shame that I made a mockery of it by accidentally bang healing its gimmick. Stealth is another Metro Last Light feature implemented retroactively in Metro 2043. The implementation of stealth mechanics meant that Metro 2043's armor system was revamped, and that you can no longer purchase armor. Now the armor automatically changes for you after certain story moments. The initial release came with two purchasable armor sets, the stealth armor and the heavy armor. The stealth armor was rendered obsolete by the inclusion of the lead light on Artyom's watch, which is basically a visibility meter, so they pretty much scrapped the entire system. So the stealth system is serviceable if a bit limited in certain areas. First of all you can control luminosity by turning light bulbs and electrical panels off, which I like a lot. In addition, most light sources including the lanterns that enemies carry on their heads can be shot, so there's that. You have lethal and non-lethal silent takedowns and throwing knives, as well as silenced pistols if you don't feel like getting up close and personal. Not only silenced pistols, you can equip most weapons with a silencer, which is pretty cool. Finally, large populated hostile areas feature vents and ditches that the player can use to sneak past patrols, so if you're in a pacifist mood, you can embrace the rat life and avoid guards. Metro stealth is fun, and there's enough variety in terms of level design and enemy placement slash variety to justify its existence. Plus, the game's design encourages the player to spend as little resources as possible on tackling human opponents and save them for mutants, so there's a strong incentive to engage with the stealth mechanics. Metro stealth might be fun, but it's dragged down by a few, let's call them design quirks. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but god damn it, why can't I lean around the sides? It's such a basic feature. You can sorta roughly estimate enemy positions through the shadows and light beams they cast, but it's not ideal. Additionally, while Redux improved the AI, it's still inconsistent. Like, guards get startled when you reload your weapon near them, but not by light bulbs being shot off, which is a pretty strange thing not to notice in a dimly lit metro where light is at a premium. I could go on, but now that I think about it, I don't know if criticizing metro's stealth beyond pointing out the obvious flaws is fair since this feature was literally shoehorned in. It's not like it's the worst stealth system out there, it's just that it's the skeleton of a good stealth system, and you can't help but feel frustrated it's not fleshed out, especially since stealth is such a good fit for metro setting. Metro 2043 is one of those games that come across as worse than they actually are if their individual components are analyzed. The gunplay is good, but nothing to write home about. The stealth is again decent, but so fundamentally flawed that it's unable to stand on its own. Combat with mutants is intense and heart pumping, but it's plagued by a layer of jank that prevents it from being fully enjoyable. But when taken as a package with the little immersive micro mechanics mentioned earlier and the great world building, Metro is a truly special game that I highly recommend you check out. Thanks for watching. As always, a huge thank you to my wonderful patrons whose generosity makes these videos possible. I'll see you next time.